um, we want Jack as a driver. So they approached me, and I said, well, can I try it out first? Oh, no, 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 they said, you can't do that. It's not even in the country. And this was early in 63. Well, finally, it came over to England uh, in time for the Daily Express International Trophy, Trophy meeting at Silverstone on the Grand Prix circuit. And it arrived on the Thursday. In those days, it was Thursday, Friday practice, and um, Saturday race. It arrived on the Thursday, and all of us were amazed at its size. Nobody thought it would handle. Nobody thought it would stop. Dan Gurney had come over two years earlier with a Chevrolet Impala and lost a front wheel during a duel with the Jaguars. And they all sort of rather poo-hooed this big old galaxy. But all it had got was um, standard tires on it, and the racing Firestone tires had not arrived from the States. So I said to Jeff Uren, look, I, just, I must just take this thing around the track for two or three laps just to get the feel of it. Uh, so I'll, off I went on, on standard tires. And Jeff said, look, for God's sake, be careful because you know, we don't want any problems. Well, after about three laps, I burst a rear tire. And I pulled up along the hangar straight. <coughs> the Jaguars went by. Graham Hill giving me friendly sort of finger signs. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> the car then had to be retrieved uh, at the end of the practice session. So a bit of a disaster. And all the people that know best were saying, well, there you are. So what happens when you bring American cars to England? So the next day, there was the, um, uh, the joy of seeing the racing tires fitted, the fast end racing tires. I went out and got pole position. Uh, I was told to ease the car off the start line very carefully, not to put my foot down until the power, uh, uh, until the clutch was right back, so we didn't slip the clutch. And so I made a slow start and was the fourth in the uh, first bend, Cops Corner. Up we went to Beckett's, and then I was still fourth, and then we turned down Hangar Straight, and Halfway down Hangar Straight, I was behind these three um, Jaguars. And I thought, this car's got so much power, I think I can get by the lot of them. So I did. And, <laughs> and here it is. The uh, ML9A, the car below in the Rotunda. Royal Salvadori in a 3.8 Mark II Jaguar. Michael Salmon, a 3.8 Mark II Jaguar. Brett Graham Hill in the 3.8 Mark II Jaguar. Another one back here. As I braked for Stowe Corner, I thought they'll rush past me because they've got disc brakes and I haven't. I had, I had four drum brakes, incidentally. The, the car was later fitted with front discs, but that was not this race. So they didn't come past me, and I thought, well, that's incredible. So the brakes are better than I thought they were. Went off down to Club Corner, gained a bit. Again, I thought they could try and come by me, but they didn't. They didn't succeed. Up through Abbey Curve, very fast, up to Woodcote Corner. This is the old original Grand Prix circuit in Silverstone, not this thing you know today. And um, as I went across the finish line, the end of the first lap, I was about 100 yards ahead. So I thought, oh my God, that's, that's incredible. And I just went very steadily then, went on to win the race. And everybody said, oh, can't believe it. Is this the end of the Jaguars? Oh, no, said the clever ones. You wait till it gets to the short circuits, Crystal Palace, and Indy Circuit at Brands Hatch. Anyhow, what then happened was that I did go to... Um, uh, to Brands Hatch uh, on the short circuit and won again against the Jaguars and again at Crystal Palace and the Jaguars never ever beat that car that was the end of Jaguar domination in the British Touring Car Championship and that is the car that ended their, their domination and I'm very very proud to have it um, uh, I waited 25 years to get it I knew that um, it was owned by Bob Oltoff, a teammate of mine in the Wilmot Racing Team, who bought it from the John Wilmot team. He won the 1965 Touring Car Championship in South Africa with it, and uh, he 
we had it for 25 years. He never raced it again after winning the championship. And finally, I got it from him in 1990. It's the only one that exists of four that came into, in, in, into this country. In 1964, I raced it again. But there was a hot shoe on the track in 1964, driving the works Lotus Cortina. His name was Jimmy Clark. And Jimmy Clark did am amazing things with uh, Lotus Cortinas when he wasn't driving Formula One cars and winning world championships. And here is a picture which I think sort of epitomizes the excitement of the time. There's my galaxy. We seem to have quite interesting scoops here, which are no longer on the car. But that was to cool the, the brakes down. And here's Jimmy right up my backside, a bit of understeer, a bit of smoke coming off the tires. And this is what he did in Hilton Park. And this is what he did. He harassed me. And he, 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 he closed up. He closed up on all the corners and did just what you see him doing there. But what he couldn't do was out-accelerate me. And I could out-accelerate him. So out of the corners, I pulled away. And under braking, he came up behind me. And this went on for 20 laps. I'm pleased to say I won the race. And I must uh, tell you that Jimmy never actually ever beat me. He was the only Lotus Cortina driver that could get anywhere close to me in 64. But he never actually beat me. Some people think he did, but he actually didn't. And uh, he, he raced in 64. He raced the Alan Brown Galaxy at, at Brands Hatch. And I made pole position in mine, and he was second. He made a better start than I did. He led into the first corner, and he led for the first three or four laps. And then when I was thinking to myself, you know, he's adjusted very quickly to this car. This was a skill that Jimmy Clark had and no other did. He could make all, he could make corrections to a badly handling car by just absorbing those uh, problems. And um, he won the race. I retired, sadly, with a, 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 a puncture, which is very sad. So Jimmy Clark won the race, but he was ahead of me when, um, when he, uh, uh, um, you know, when I retired. So I shall always wonder whether I would have beaten him or he would have beaten me. I did, meet, I did manage to beat Dan Gurney at Silverstone in, 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 in sister cars. Now, uh, just look at the watch. I think we're all right at the moment. Um, the next step in my life uh, was um, the 250 GTO Ferrari. That car is a legendary car now. Um, they trade for millions of pounds. There was only 36 ever built. Uh, 39, actually, sorry, because there were three, three with, the, uh, with, with, the, with the 64 bodywork. And that was an amazing car. I was lucky enough to um, uh, be invited to drive the Maranello Concessionaires 250 GTO uh, and also the John Coombs GTO. Uh, and this is a rather good picture of, there's two pictures here. You've got to look at the top one first. This is Mallory Park coming out of the hairpin. Uh, I am in the Maranello Concessionaires 250 GTO leading Graham Hill in the Coombs, John Coombs Racing lightweight E-Type. And this went on for, I think it was a 20 lap race, this went on for quite a lot of laps. And then the old Wiley Fox uh, outmaneuvered me going into the hairpin, and this is how we finished. Graham in the lead with me right behind him. Um, he was so happy that he'd beaten me. Uh, but he was such a great friend too.